last time we talked about logical languages right and uh, okay so from here you will actually see me also yeah so what was the thing that we agreed on we agreed on that uh, there are these logical languages it could be languages of arithmetic these are the ones that we saw language of order language of graphs language of uh, groups rings what have you or some ad hoc languages maybe for databases ai whatever though i didn't take such examples we'll stick to only mathematical examples but uh, you know so the deal is that you have some structures in mind and you formulate some language now one thing that is common to all these languages were connectives like the kind that we talked about and or not implies quantifiers like for all there exists but there was some vocabulary that changes for different languages like in the case of groups we had one binary operation symbol right with a little circle here we had a binary relation and here we had one binary relation x less than y perhaps and here you had uh, addition multiplication exponentiation maybe successor function things of this kind or order as well right and then we said we can talk about different fragments and then there are certain things that we said we will not allow i remember somebody suggested this and uh, we don't want this right and this three dots as i said is something i don't like right no i like that like it very much it's either i don't know i don't want i want to banish it from the language because of whatever reasons why okay or uh, this kind of recursive definition sorry yeah somebody said something can you repeat okay yeah so this is a recursive definition we said this is these are things that we will not allow otherwise we are happy with um, this kind of languages right and so we said okay so basically you are designing a language to talk about mathematics and uh, the idea is that we want to talk about statements that are true or false right that's what all this was about i mean but uh, if we just write something like 2x plus 3y equals 22 is this true or false well typically in school you write something like that to mean that you solve right and solve this is the same as saying there exists x there exists y and what is x and y well if you are talking about arithmetic you are talking about natural numbers or integers maybe you might be talking about real numbers whatever but the context tells you what kind of x it is right whereas when you write x plus y equals y plus x you have in mind that this is true for all x for all y right so quantifiers actually tell you what kind of use that you have for so we do you use equations a lot so that is another thing that primitive to this whole business but so it's a language in which we want to write mathematical statements i think that's what we are talking about right now and these statements are as i said true or false but if you look at math books you don't stop here right i mean you have lot more you don't just write and and or and if then and of course we do but we also write assume that 
What about that? Assume that we say consider, we say let, we say clearly, yeah, obviously and then this beautiful expression which really defines mathematics for me, you say things like Yeah, I mean one of my colleagues says anybody who says without loss of generality, without thinking about it is a mathematician, right. So it almost defines the way mathematicians talk, right. What about these things? Shouldn't there be part of your language? Well, if you actually think about it, of course they should be and we will uh, make them. So these are going to be, well, things like clearly and obviously may be I do not know because uh, uh, you know proof by intimidation some of these things yeah. But this is all part of the language of proof, these are not so right. The language in which you write down proofs where you do want to have, this is extremely important, you do want to say let x be, let g be a group, right, let g be a graph, let v be a vertex in the graph, that is extremely important, we want that, right. You do want to say assume something, right, and you do want to say q e d, you want to say contradiction, right. That is a contradiction, therefore it is absurd, etc. Right? So, but these are what I would call elements of the language of proof that we want, and we will have all that, right? So I promise you that we will have. But these are ways of stringing statements together. The statements themselves. So if you take a language, what does it have? It has words, and then you have connectors. From words, you move to sentences, and then you string sentences together to form paragraphs. So, for us in the language of mathematics, the statements is what we are, the language of statements is what we are now looking at and the language of statements so far contains these, right. Now, what about other things that may be there in statements? Well, we do say in 1846, uh, you know, somebody showed that, right. Yeah. What about that? What about tense, past, future? That is all part of statements. Now, what one thing that we can say is that we want to talk about things that are true or false in mathematical structures and hopefully those statements do not depend on whether it is today or tomorrow or right. You want to say this graph has a Hamiltonian cycle. Well, hopefully if it has a Hamiltonian cycle today, it will have one tomorrow or yesterday as well. So, in some sense we are not worried about time in this. Later on in the course we will also look at temporal statements, statements whose true or false, truth or falsity changes with time or space, right. Something that is true here in Chennai but not uh, true in Delhi, right. So, we, so mathematical statements in general that is not a problem. If you want to st make statements about mathematical structures, you are not locating them in time and space. These are called indexical statements in linguistics, you throw them out, you do not care, no problem about that. So you are not worried about that, you are not worried about adjectives, right. This is an elegant construction, that is great, but I am not sure that I want to worry about it, right. It is a dirty, you know, uh, by messy induction we show that, right. Yeah, I mean, we will throw out all these adjectives, all that. So, some primitive stuff, why does this suffice for that? Well, let us not worry about it, at least this is a familiar language, right, that is good enough. So, let us not worry about this part for now. So, for sort of logic, the language that we are looking at is simply this language of statements, the language of proof will come later. Yeah. If you have any question, please ask. Otherwise, I will get into the, get to the formal definition now.
And another thing is about in quantifiers, we only talked about two quantifiers, right? For all x, there exists x. Are there other quantifiers that are of interest? Anyone else? Anyone has a suggestion for a quantifier? Yeah? Apart from for all x and there exists x, can you think of any other quantifier? Such that. Sorry? Such that. Such that. But that is not a quant. Uh, is that what? Sir, so uniqueness. I, I, I can't hear. Who is speaking? Sir, me, Siddharth. Ah, yeah, Siddharth. Tell me. Huh. Uh, Sir, so uniqueness. Uniqueness, yeah. So, we do write there exists unique x, yeah, such that something, something, something. This is a typical notation you might have seen, there exists unique x, right, okay. So, let us throw that in, we want that, what else? So, we will want for all x, we want there exists x, we want there exists unique x and then Siddharth, actually with there exists and for all, can you see how we can get rid of this unique business? Suppose I want to say there exists unique x such that some alpha of x holds, right. One way of saying that is there exists x such that alpha x holds and for any y, if alpha of y holds, that implies that y equals x, yeah. Yes, Siddharth, does this say that the x is unique? There is an x which satisfies alpha and whenever there is a y that satisfies alpha, that y must be the same as x, yeah. So, you do not have to have a separate one. Any other quantifier that is of interest? Aditya, I see that you want to say something. Aditya, they, yeah. I am not able to hear you. Uh, you are, you are muted, okay. Somebody else? No other quantifier, that is all. I am surprised. I thought there would be lots. What about? Uh, yeah, uh, Venkatesh here. Yes. Aditya says in chat. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I have to uh, look at it. Does chat. not exist. Does not exist. Okay. Fine. That is fine. There, let me call it, there does not exist x alpha of x. Yeah. But can somebody else suggest how I can code this up? Yes. Shubankar? Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can use the negation. Precisely, uh, yeah. Yeah, which we have. Yeah, Shopnil, is it? Yeah, you should just tell me who it is so I know it is. Yeah. You can always write yeah. for all x, not alpha x. This is the same as saying there does not exist x. Okay. Well, Shopnil, the ball is with you. So, you want to suggest some quantifier right now? Any other quantifier? For, uh, for some x is there exists x, there exists x is the yeah, same yeah, as yeah, for yeah. some x. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about for most x? Yeah, we do write mathematical statements of the form, right. What about for any random x? For any randomly picked x, for any x picked uniformly at random, we do write statements of this kind, right? What about for infinitely many x? Okay, so this is fun and uh, some of them are easy, some of them are difficult. Uh, we will be able to code up some of these, some of these we cannot, okay. And as I said, this whole 
interesting game in this whole thing is to find out what is definable and what is not, right? When it's something definable as easily as that, you just write the definition, right? Like we saw, like in the case of there exists unique x or there does not exist or whatever, right? These things, it's not clear at all how we can go about writing statements of that kind. So, let's postpone, right? When in doubt, postpone. And if I forget, remind me, right? We will discuss these things later on. After we get familiar with first order logic and reasoning about mathematical like structures in first order logic. Some of them we can and some of them we can't. I am not claiming that we can do everything. Okay. So, the formal definition now, at last. So, let me start with. Sir, hello. Yeah. Sir, Omnivo here. So, uh, huh. like writing down, while writing down in a book, we mostly, uh, sometimes we say like claiming a statement and then proving it. So, is that claiming also part of? That is what I call part of, claim is extremely important. Words like claim, proposition, lemma and come on, which is the most important word that for a math textbook? Theorem. Theorem, Theorem. come on. Even more important example, counter example. Yeah. Of course, we want all this, but they are all part of the language of proofs and we will have, I promise you. Right? We do want all these. Let us assuming claim. So, these are not quantifiers, these are uh, no. important but something else. So, they are not, that is why I said this is not part of the language of statements. We will write the statements and prefix the statement with claim, theorem, example, etc. So, it is part of what I call the language of proofs. Okay. Sir. Yeah. So, if you want to. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, sir. Ah, yes, Mega. Sir, so what about uh, such that? Such that is part of almost everything. When I write this, for instance, if I put this colon, I won't even put colon, but I am saying this colon is like a such that. For yeah, every so x. That, that is what I noticed the colon in the, your previous statements, and we did not explicitly uh, have a definition for what that colon stands for. No. Does it mean such that? Uh, it can mean, it can mean. But right now, I do not have it. We will see when we need it, we will put it in. Okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah, the colon does not exist, it is just it. Yeah? Okay. So, what is the definition of first order logic? First thing is, yeah, who is it? Yeah, yes, we know. There is something in the chat also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, tell me. I do not have to look. Huh. Uh, what about belongs, belongs to. to? Oh, very good. I think Jonaki, you should just ask. Yeah, it's easier for me to directly answer. Yeah. So, what about belongs to? Yeah. X is a set, and I want to say little x belongs to it. Yeah. So, well, we said we'll have relations, right? The example of a relation I took was in the language of graphs. In the language of sets, this is what I would have. It's a binary relation between two elements. The one thing that we have not said anything about is that this is an element and this is a type, right? I never had, I mean, this is a set, right? This is an element and it is a set. They are different types really, yeah? So, I do not have any notion of types at all. I have not talked about anything of a type, right? For instance, uh, but we do not right now need it because we can always say I am talking about in the language of graphs. E is interpreted as the edge relation. In the language of sets, this is interpreted as membership, right? In the language of order, this is interpreted as order and so on. And that is precisely what we want to discuss now. Yes, Jonaki? So, it is basically that language of business. So, when I say first order logic, there, are, there is a notion of a language. First, we decide what language you are, is it the language of arithmetic, language of graphs, language of Databases, what have you? Language of simply CL complexes, I do not care. You fix that. So, you fix a certain vocabulary that comes from the lang the particular structures that you want to describe and then we start. So, this is the idea. So, first order logic, the idea is that any logic, any FO language 
<coughs> any first order language is defined by its parameters. some parameters. So, that is what we will write in general L, L arithmetic has certain parameters. What are the parameters that we were talking about for instance last class? 0, 0 is a parameter right. We want to put in something called 0, we want to put in something called successor. Successor is a unary function. So, let me use this notation to say successor is a unary function with a 1 sitting on top, then plus addition is a binary function right it has two two arguments multiplication which again is a function with two arguments exponentiation let me just throw in everything right now right which again has and i'm putting a semicolon here this is all notation that i'm just going to use huh? this notation we will formally define and so on but this is what we said is natural last time and then a relation right the order relation this is a rich language of arithmetic and we said we'll look at many fragments where we'll throw away some part of it etc and then the language of graphs the language of graphs there is no fixed element at all like this. nothing right so let me just put a dash and then what functions in the language of graphs no functions let me put a dash and then we said there is a binary relation that is the language of graphs. The language of order same thing nothing nothing this is the language of order in which like I said very quickly last time we started writing statements to talk about linear orders, dense linear orders, dense linear orders without minimal elements etc., maximal elements blah blah language of sets what does it have again nothing no functions and membership that's enough from that you can now you can say ha ah, but this is not enough because i want subset surely yeah but i can write x subset of y as i can simply write it as for all z z belongs to x implies z belongs to y that will define subset for me. So, it is enough if you have membership you can think about it right. Language of groups. So, this is gr is graphs here actually gr is reserved for groups. No elements a binary function symbol and that is it. Assert the identity. No, you do not need it. Who said that? Chopnil. Yes, sir. Ah, so, that is an exercise for you. Can you tell me why I do not need the identity? Yeah, tell me how I how I can write it. I thought by now you should have. Yeah, yeah. sir. Uh, like, 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 uh, can we just use variables like there exist like such that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bolo bolo. There exists X such that. Yeah. Yeah, there exists X such that for all for all uh, Y. For all Y X dot Y equal to Y dot X equal to Y. Yeah, actually this is two things here. X dot Y equals Y and y dot x equals y ok. Now, any time you want to use the identity right you use this x and then put further right yeah. So, that will serve very well. So, you do not need an explicit identity ok. So, it is clear that see all of us you have done school mathematics at all right you already know this logical language that I am describing right you are used to working with this all the time that is what I am pointing out right. 
this kind of notation, we have got used to working with them, whether formally, informally, it doesn't matter because if you are reading math at all, you are used to that. So, that is what I wanted, want you to start with. You are not learning anything new, something that you already know. But as I said, logicians are bureaucrats, pedantic, they want to fix the meaning very, very carefully, precisely and that is what we are trying to do. So, this is, so in general, what is a first order language? I do not know what are the three things that I am going to have. I am going to have some thing, some fixed elements, right, like 0 here, right. Maybe you might put 1. In the language of rings, you might have 2 elements that you want to designate, right. And uh, you, you know, or you may define it explicitly or you may throw in an explicit element, yeah. In the language of rings, 0, 1 is very common to assume to, that you have and then, uh, so need not be only 1. And then again you have some functions, there is a list of functions that you have. How many in general? Who cares? Whatever you like. Then relations, how many? Who cares? Right? Whose money are we saving? So, a first order language is defined by, what is the general way of saying all this? The parameters is written as, so this is how we are going to write from now on, L will have three things, C, F, P. C stands for a countable set of constant symbols. Symbols denoting constants. They are not constants, but they are symbols denoting constants. Is this clear? Because I can write 0 for that symbol or I could write 0. Who cares? Right? It is just something in the language. So, what we are describing is what anyone would call the syntax of first order logic. What does the word syntax mean? Somebody? Sir, why only countable set? Why only countable set? Why not any arbitrary set? A set of. Well, I mean you can have continuum cardinality, whatever cardinality you like, but that will make proofs more difficult. So, for now, I am going to assume that until further notice, all sets that I assume, right, in the language are going to be countable sets. Right. So, countable set of constant, constant symbols, countable set of function symbols. Why am I saying function symbols? These, this is simply a symbol for denoting my plus. This does not make it addition, huh? right. In the language of arithmetic, this could be standing for standard addition, it could be standing for some completely bizarre addition that you have in mind, who cares? It is just a symbol, right. That this means addition is all in your head. In the syntax, what we are describing is the grammar. There is no meaning. Uh, grammar is also not a good idea. It is basically how you string things together. That is all. Function symbols, each of them with some arity. And I am writing here because we will always write it on top. Similarly, this uh, P is a set of predicate symbols. Again a countable set of predicate symbols. What is a predicate? We have seen lots of examples of predicate symbols, less than, edge relation E, membership in the language of sets. These are all binary relation symbols, but we also use something like this, prime X where this is a unary relation symbol, right? Uh, yeah. Sir. Yeah? Sir. Sir. Ah, bolo, bolo. Uh, is there any restriction on the range and domain of the function symbol or predicate? Um, yeah, good question. But how do you actually, in, if you remember those painful days in class 9 or whenever you learned this uh, domain and range of function, right? Um, how do you actually write all that? 
you will say for every x there is a unique y that you associate etc right now that's precisely what this language is very good at right so collecting all those elements into what you call the domain collecting all those y's into a element which you call in um, range is all straightforward routine exercises that we can do we don't have to isolate that and give it any particular name yeah Sir. so yeah Again, say who so you can look for the person. Sir, so, no. Ah, okay. Sir, don't we need variables? Of course, we need variables. Yes, because I have been saying x, y, and so on. They are not there yet, but they are not parameters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right now, I am describing Thank parameters. Thank you, sir. Okay. Something somewhere is the full screen. Maybe this. Yeah. Okay. So, the parameters to the logic that I am describing, basically the parameters tell me which uh, particular language that I am working with, right. The off, remember the off, the language of graphs, the language of groups, the language of rings, whatever, whatever, that particular off is what is being described by the parameters, yeah. So, in general, I will write it as, so C is a set C0, C1 dot f is f0 k0 f0 k1 f0 k2 dot 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 f1 k1 f k2 so i'll just write it as f0 f1 k1 f2 k2 dot 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 predicate symbols p0 m0 P1, M1. So, these are, so that is what will fix a parameter for me. This is the supply of constant symbols that I will assume, supply of function symbols with appropriate arities, relation symbols or predicate symbols with appropriate arities, right. That will fix the. Now, you can say, are you going to have countable this thing. This is to say that I do not want to assume that there are three function symbols, eight predicate symbols and so on. In practice, any particular language that you work with, like I wrote down, right, in the case of language of real numbers, language of arithmetic, whatever you have, that will have some fixed number of, this will be some three of them. There will be eight function symbols, four predicate symbols, etc. Et but the main point of first order logic is to say I want to think about any first order language that I want to worry about. So, I am not interested in any particular bounded supply. And like Siddharth mentioned, we will look at languages where you have an uncountable set of constants as well. They need not be countable either, but that is for later. Let us not worry about it for the moment, right. So, uh, the logicians are very happy to work with arbitrary cardinalities, right, no problem at all, right. We just say, so what is the cardinality of this language? Let us see, what is the cardinality of this language? The size of C plus the size of F plus the size of P, right. Well, they are all countable sets, so you know that this entire thing is countable, right. So, Sam, yeah, uh, sir, this is Shyamna. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, actually, uh, earlier we have defined that, I mean, we have stated that. Uh, we also have those uh, quantifiers and uh, uh, connective and those variables also. Uh, so, like uh, whenever we are defining this language, we are using only uh, E as a representative of a constant, F as representing as a, as a representative of functions, and P of parameters. So, of, of uh, predicates, yeah. P are mutually exclusive, but yeah, predicates. Yeah. So, this P are mutually exclusive, but we will have all that. I am only describing the parameters. When I say parameters, I mean these. Yeah. After that, we will build up more things. Yeah. We have not. What about those variables and yeah, yeah, we will we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me, give me a moment. Yeah. Just a moment. Yeah. First, I am defining okay. the language is defined by its parameters, by which I mean that once you fix the parameters, it will tell me what is this language because the rest of it is common to all the things across. The common part we will describe. I am just okay. saying that, yeah, okay. Is this clear? Yeah, these three are like input. 
before I define my particular logical, you have to tell me what your constant functions. So, if Shanka comes and tells me that I am defining a logic for you, I will ask, okay, tell me your constant symbols, function symbols, predicate symbols, let us get to business, right. We have to get to business, but first you have to, you have to tell me what these are, right, yeah. Somebody else? Sir, uh, the, hello. Yes, who is it? Uh, the predicate symbols. Uh, so, they, they are also like common to languages, right? They contain things like belongs to and less than. So, that is not clear to me at all because you in one language, in one mathematical language, that belongs to symbol may have a particular meaning. In another mathematical language, um, that belongs to may have a very different meaning, right? For instance, this thing that we are used to writing this set theoretic membership thing, right. Now, is it a well founded relation? What does that mean? Can I make an infinite chain of you know a set whose member is a set, whose member is a set, you know like those dolls, doll within a doll within a doll, right. Can I go on making an infinite such uh, sequence, set of, set of, set of, set of, set of, set of infinitely? Well, if you cannot, right, if I pick another set and keep looking for its members, if it always ends, that chain ends finitely, I will say that this relation is well founded. Typically, if you pick a math book and read whatever sets it is constructing, this would be a well founded relation. But Axel's book is on non well founded sets, ok. So, his meaning that he works for is very different from the standard analysis book that you pick up. He, you know, so you can do analysis with, uh, you know, uh, where you construct sets where the membership relation goes infinitely deep. So, the meaning is in your head, that is precisely what logicians are after. You fix your meaning, I do not want to fix predicates uniformly across everything, right. Meaning, so the meaning of these is negotiable, right. You can give meanings to all this as you like. You have written this symbols for me, those symbols we will write in the language and we will give it meaning as you like. After that, the rest of the meaning is constructed for quantifiers, connectives and so on in a fixed way across all the languages, yeah, ok. Let us go further, you will, yeah, yes. Sir, uh, can you also say the name of the book where you are talking about the non well found is the oh, key. Sorry, Axel, like Peter Axel. Peter Axel has written several books, there, there is at least one which is, yeah, on non well founded sets. Ok, uh, yes, Mega. Sir, uh, do the parameters of a language uniquely define it? Like for a language, if we know what the C, F, and P is. Then does it uniquely define uh, the language that we are dealing with? Because the quantifiers may be common for other languages. So, if we have the… Absolutely. That is the whole idea of parameters. Once you fix the meaning of the parameters, the meaning of every state statement in that language is immediately given to you. That is the deal. How do you do that magic? Let us do that and see, yeah. Hopefully, we will do it very soon, yeah. Uh, no, no, not of this. This is a notation to say, I do not know how many constant symbols there are. I will talk about like one language. There will be many different languages. So, this is not like one fixed. No, no, wait. Uh, Shivani, I am not saying that there is one fixed C, F and different subsets will give different languages. No, this is a notation to say that when I have a first order language L, that language will have these three sets, that is all. The cardinality of these sets is at most countable and if it is countable, I write this like this, that is all, right. So, different, this is not like one particular set from which you make subsets to make different languages, ok. It's just that you choose this triple for each language. That's all. Okay. So, sir, uh, this, uh, this, these parameters are defined for uh, 
Correct. Yeah. So when you say language so of graphs, you. That's right. You remember I put a dash. I put a dash here for when I talked about the language of order. I put a dash here, dash here, and then put this. So this can be empty. This can, but I hope all of them are not empty, right? We will look at the empty language. By the way, don't worry. We will look at the empty language where there are no constant symbols, function symbols, predicates. Why not? It, it's allowed. It's a set, right? It's a countable set. Empty set is a very much a countable set. So it's okay. We can have a. That's right. I, I, I've already said any of them can be empty. That means what? This is empty, this is empty, this is half. So you can have no problem. And as I said, in the worst case, all of them can be empty as well. Yeah. The language of arithmetic has all these populated, right? The language of order has only this populated, not these. The language of groups has only this populated, not these two, and so on. Yeah. You and if you start looking, thinking about various languages that occur in mathematics, you will find, you know, rich variation. But the point is that this is enough. Okay. Yeah. Shall we move on? Okay. So, these are going to be the parameters. From that, you still have to build the language of statements. Huh? This is only the parameters. From that, we still have to get there. So, how do you do that? Well, so, okay. So, the syntax of statements is going to be given by So, I fix my parameters this is given now whatever it is. So, my statements are going to be given by some which I will call primitive statements. I do not know what they are. Right? Primitive statements I will fix somehow, like equations, right? Equations are very usual things in mathematical language, right? But once I have primitive statements, I can combine them. So, I can write if alpha is a statement, and beta is a statement, then so, or alpha, let me use these. Yeah. And this is read as alpha and beta, this is read as or. This is read as not, this is read as implies, this is read as if and only if, and this is read as for all, and this is as yes, there exists. So, what is this saying? If you already give me a statement, some primitive statements will give you some bunch of statements. As I said, we do not know what they are, but for now, if and you will be using the parameters in the primitive statements. Right? Once you have some bunch of primitive statements, you can combine them, right? You can combine them to make compound statements. So, these things you can call compound statements. By using connectives, uh, and is a connective, it is a binary connective, or is a binary connective, not is a unary connective, implies and equivalence or if and only if are binary connectors. These are all part of what we call Boolean logic or propositional logic that almost everybody said they were familiar with when they wrote to me about the course. Yeah. And then you have quantifiers for all x alpha, there exists x alpha and so on. Yeah. This is the way this game goes. Is it clear? 
you can say, ah, but where did the x come from? Where? So now the next thing that you fix So, apart from the parameters, right, Shankar has come and given me the parameters. Now, for any first order logic language, I have a bunch of variables, right. This is something common to all the languages, first order languages. You will have, a, and again, this is a countable set of variables. I will use x0, x1, etc., xy, xyz, and their numbered subscripts are going to be what we use for variables, right. So, for, so what if alpha is a statement and x is a variable, you are allowed to write for all x alpha as a compound statement. So, now what is the idea of writing statements of this kind? Now, I can you can see that I can write for all x, for all y, alpha and beta. This is okay, right. Because alpha, beta are some statements, therefore alpha and beta is a statement. For all, if this is a statement, therefore for all y, alpha and beta is a statement. This whole thing is a statement, therefore I can write and so on. But still of course, if there are no primitive statements at all, this whole thing is meaningless, right. Because if this set of primitive statements is empty, this whole thing remains empty, right. Because it says, if you are given these, well, if you are given nothing, you produce nothing from nothing no problem. So, you need to populate these. Once you populate these, this whole thing is. I think, I hope that answers Sulagna's worry that, you know, I have to somehow define this, right. So, now I have defined this, but this we still have to do something. Sir, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some questions, somebody? Okay. So, what kind of primitive statements that we want? Simplest primitive statement that we can write. Let me write, where did I keep the eraser somewhere, yeah. Um, sir, uh, hello, can you hear Yes, who is it? The standard, yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah, can you uh, define what you mean by set of variables once please? Why should I define a set of variables? It's a set. I am just calling it the name, right? Anything that is going to appear here is what I call a variable, right? It is a so, there is something which is uh, external to the language, like it, it, the language does not come with a second. It is, no, 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 the language comes with variables. I mean, um, you know, any logical language that you do this thing, it is going to have a set of variables. The point is, it is not a parameter, that is what I say. The parameters will tell me what are the function symbols, what are the relation symbols, those are the things that you are going to give meaning to from outside. The variables you do not give meaning to from outside, okay. I will come to the variables. When we give meaning, it will become very important. Right now, there is no meaning to anything. We are just saying how to write, yeah, sorry. Yeah, they are all symbols, right. Yeah, so we just, I mean, by the way, uh, um, when I was in TFR, we visited by, uh, Bishwambar Pahi from uh, Jaipur, who was a philosopher of logic, a philosophical logician, uh, a grand old man. And uh, he made it a point uh, that these and or, these are all symbols, right. So, he would write things like alpha, kh, beta and alpha, I do not know, ma, beta for you can write this for conjunction and this for disjunction. What is stopping you from doing that? So, as I said, logicians are very fussy about all these things, right. The meaning is in your head, right. The language itself does not give you the meaning, right. Language only gives you the syntax. You write the meaning as you like, right. And you want to discuss different possible meanings and uh, negotiate to what is a common meaning, etc., etc., okay. So, yeah. Sir. Yes? Sir. Sir, uh, what about economics? Like, uh, we also uh, use a we also use a specific value uh, to be assigned to a state. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want statements to be true or false, right? So this is the main point, right? We want our statements to be true or false. Primitive statements, how do I decide that they are true or false? Ah, thereby hangs the whole theory, right? This whole business is about that. If you can, what now we are saying is, if you can somehow give the meaning of primitive statements, if you can somehow decide whether primitive statements are true or false, this will tell you how to find the meaning of the, whether the compound statement is true or false. How do you find out? If alpha is true as well as beta is true, if both are true, then this whole thing is true. If any one of them is true, the whole thing is true. If whenever this is true, this better be true, right? We all know Boolean logic, this is what we reason about. This is true exactly when this is also true, yeah? And whatever value you give to x, x is a variable, whatever value you give to x, this is true. This is the intuitive meaning that we have got. We have not defined it, but it is clear enough. Yeah. Uh, so, one more thing, uh, like whenever we are assigning any value to some x, the x was a variable before x and after assigning any value, it has to become a constant. Uh, like, uh, whenever we are solving equations, we just do this thing. I agree, I agree. We are, uh, we agree. are solving an equation for x and but, then x becomes a constant. So, yeah, yeah. Is there any intersection between these two, uh, intersection of concepts, uh, uh, in between these two sets of <laughs> variables and constants? Like yes, one yes. One thing was uh, earlier variable, then it has become a constant. So, okay. how can this be possible? Ah, variable cannot become a constant, variable remains a variable, right? So, the variable gets a value, right? Okay, so um, we will get to this when we get to the meanings of these statements. Right now, they are meaningless, they are only statements, right? Just you have written and they may mean whatever they mean, right? So do not worry about it, we will get to it. But uh, I mean, what are variables, right? I mean, this is uh, uh, the notion of a logical variable is something that we will need to think about carefully. Like I said, uh, in middle school, there is plenty of confusion in this whole business, right? When you write in middle school, you start reading about equations and the first thing you come across is x plus 5 equals 8. And x is a variable. What is variable here? There is nothing variable about it. x is exactly a unique value, namely 3, because that is how you learn your arithmetic, right? So, you call it a variable, it sounds ridiculous. And then for kids, another painful thing is, you know, draw the graph of the equation y equal to 3, right? I mean, I mean, this is a shock. You say y equals 3, what is there to draw? And then, you know, x equal to 5, you are supposed to draw, right? So, yeah, so the notion of variable is extremely confused in mathematics texts that and then for those who know programming languages, in computer science, the whole idea of a variable is something that varies, right? It will vary. The whole point is that it does not constant, right? So, in logic, you want to fix all these notions, make them very precise and we will do that, okay? So, but what about primitive statements? What are primitive statements? Let us, what primitive statements to, are we going to have? One very good primitive statement we can write as x equals y. Right? Of course, x is a variable, y is a variable, you want to write x is equal to y. And then of course, because not is there, you can always write x is not equal to y. But we do not want to have only that, right? We want to write x equals y plus 5. How, where is the plus 5 coming in? There is no plus in my language. Ah, but you have a supply of function symbols, right? So I do want to write x equals f of y. And then if you think a little bit further, why should not I write g of f of x equals h of f of y, right? All these are okay. So, and that is the whole idea. And then I want to write something like f of y plus 3 or let me write f of y comma 3, right? Which I cannot very well do because f is unary here, yeah, g of f of x equals f of h of y comma 3. What is this 3 now? Ah, that is a constant symbol, right? So, once you have constant symbols and function symbols, 
what you can do is with function symbols, constant symbols and so on build this rich supply of what, what are these things called? Expressions, terms, logicians call them terms, right? You build terms and once you have terms, I can write T1 equals T2. That is a very good primitive statement. In fact, a huge part of mathematics is devoted to only writing equations and solving equations, right. In fact, almost all of algebra that we learnt in school was only about this solving equations in rings, fields perhaps, right. And that is about all and the entire uh, journey is about that, right. So, and particular number fields and that is all that you worry about, yeah. So, what is the language? So, let us now define terms. What are terms? Remember, we have parameters C, F, P and we have fixed the set of variables V for any language that we are defining. So, the set of terms is given by, well, Every constant symbol is a term, 3 is a term, 0 is a term, whatever you have given me, right. You fix some constant symbols and told me that they are part of the language, they are all terms that you can use freely anywhere here. every x belonging to v is a term, every variable is a term, you can use every variable anywhere inside these things. Is this clear? And then how do you build terms from constants and variables? By using function symbols. If f k belonging to f is a function symbol, of arity k, And well, the function needs arguments. How many arguments does this function want? K arguments. Well, T1 through Tk are terms. You have already built terms inductively, some T1 to Tk, then is a term. That is it. You are allowed to put f parenthesis and this. That is it. This is the term. This is what we usually call term algebra if you have right with constructors right and from and this is what we are saying. Right? And that is it. This with this and equality you have a very rich language. This is the language of equational logic right. Equational the only primitive statements are equations and then you can combine them using these, right. Algebraic theories live only with this, you do not want anything more, right. You just and then you have conditional equations, right. What are conditional equations? If this, this, this is an, e if this equals this, if T1 equals T2, then T1 prime equals T2 prime. You have a very rich, very rich exception, uh, language with and then you have quantifiers also, it is a lot of fun, okay. But something we have not used at all. What is it that we have not used in this whole thing? Predicate. predicate symbols. You have a countable supply of predicate symbols, right? Of course, you want to use them. So, primitive statements are given by. So, you have two kinds of primitive statements. One is equality. And the other kind of primitive statements is if P is a predicate symbol of arity M, then and T1 through Tm are terms, then P T1 Tm is a primitive statement.
and that is it we are through. Take any predicate symbol it expects some it is a relation right it is an MRE relation. So, it requires M arguments and you can put any terms you like right. So, you can write for instance in particular you will write x plus y is less than f of g of y comma x yeah that is a relation it is a binary relation and 2 just because we write it in you know on either side of the symbol does not matter this is you have to write it with parenthesis and write but it is all the same thing yeah. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, can we not include equality uh, in predicates? Good question. After all, it is just a binary relation, right? So, if you can you have binary relation like less than and E and so on, why not equality also? You can do that, and logicians do describe, uh, in fact, uh, you know, in most books on logic, you will find people will define first order logic with equality, first order logic without equality, just for this reason. Now, it is customary to take equality for granted that is what I am saying right. I want to give special status to equality. I do not want anybody interpreting equality as they like right. Equality is going to mean equality. What is the equality that I want? Exactly what uh, Sulagna had in mind when she was talking earlier that is that I have some elements right. In the language of arithmetic what are the elements that I have in mind? Yes in the language of arithmetic? The, num the number. Whichever number field you are working with right. Yeah. Yeah. Typically you are working with a number field I mean that might be some uh, modular arithmetic it could be you know whole numbers, integers what have you real numbers yeah. In the language of rings, in the language of fields, in the language of graphs what are the elements you have in mind when you write x and y? Vertices right or somebody suggested edges right you could have right. So, it really depends on what you have in mind. In the language of sets x and y everything stands for sets right. So, you have something in mind and so that is what you have uh, to you know build this whole business with right. So, equality on the other hand is going to mean equality in that domain right as elements they should be the same these are expressions and this is exactly what you learn as a child in class 6 right. When I write these equations what I have in mind evaluate this I will get a number, evaluate this I will get a number it should be the same number right. So, I do not want anything so when I say equality is primitive in all the languages what I mean is that meaning of equality I do not want to disturb. Of course, you can change the meaning, but that complicates things enormously. So, at least for our baby steps when we are beginning, it is good to fix equality, and that is what I am doing. And this is it. So, this completely, this what is there on the board now completely fixes the syntax of a first order logic, any first order language, as we will say. So, when we say a first order language, you give some parameters, and then from the parameters, you define the set of terms. And once you have the set of terms, you define the set of primitive statements. Primitive statements have equality or using predicate symbols. And then you have connectives. And typically, a math book, logic book will say these are the only statements. And similarly, this, 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 and these are the only terms. That is important because what you are saying is that you can build all this and you can throw in some extra terms right or extra that is not allowed right. So, these are the only statements. Now, again there is no particular sanctity associated with this particular collection of connectives and this particular connection of quantifiers. Exactly like I said we can define new quantifiers like for most x for random x you can have lots of very very interesting quantifiers and in fact in logic there is a whole theory of generalized quantifiers. Similarly, you can say why should I have only these connectives? Can you think of some other connectives instead of like and or implies 
any new connector that somebody can give me? Exclusive or. Exclusive or, yes. Any other? We had not, right? Can you think of some other unary connector? A ternary connector? Can you give me a ternary connector? Something that uses three statements and builds together one. Yeah? Well, what about if alpha, then beta, else gamma? Right? If then else is ternary. Anything else? Something with four? You can, right? That is my point. You can write whatever you want. This is only a style that is being told to you, right? You, if you want to give a logical language, build a syntax of terms, build a, that from that if you get a syntax of primitive statements, from the use your connectives, use your quantifiers, you get a full first order language, right? Now, having written this, this whole thing from now on, we will not write in this notation at all. We will use a very compact notation. That compact notation computer scientists call BNF, Bacchus Nor form, okay. Bacchus and Nor suggested this for programming languages and now this has become the standard for pretty much all formal languages and this is how we write, okay. And you will see how compact and nice it is. And it is also an exercise in writing inductive definitions. So, first we write the logical language as and my notation is always going to be that I use the semicolons as to separate those sets, right. And then I have a set of variables and the syntax of terms is given by C belonging to C, little c in big C, little x in big B, That is it. This is a and this is the definition of the syntax of first order logic, what I would call one slide definition. Let us just get the notation precisely. First, we have the parameters. C standing for constant symbols, function symbols and predicate symbols of appropriate arity, right. Each of them is written this way, C is C naught, C1, etc. F is F naught, K naught, F1, K1, dot, 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 P is P naught, M naught, P1. And then the set of terms. This is the set of terms. So, with this language L, I have a set, the script T, that is the set of terms and left hand side I have only written one T. Well, whenever you write anything, they assume that you can always write things on the right hand side with subscripts, that is all, right. So, this says every constant symbol is a term, every variable is a term. If you already have terms built inductively, 
this colon, this double colon equal is an inductive definition. If you have inductively built these and f is something from your function symbols of parity k, then this is a term. And these are the only terms, all this is part of this equal, little equational definition. This is not, right? This is our way of defining the syntax of the language. Yeah. Then alpha, beta, this is now the set of all statements. Statements I am going to call one moment. This is the set of formulas. I would not call them statements, I want, I will call them formulas. And these are going to be called atomic formulas. There is no nuclear science involved. Atomic is just historic terminology to say that there is no further structure. These are the primitive statements, right. So, these are atomic formulas and once you have atomic formulas, as you can see, inductively if alpha has a formula, negation alpha has a formula, alpha or beta has a formula, etc. And if x is a variable for all x alpha, there is. And these are the only formulas. So, this comp so that the set of all formulas of the language is given by this big set, Greek set phi. Phi is the set of all formulas of my logical language. Yeah, somebody had a question? Yes, Sir, Megha. Megha, you. Yeah. Sir, um, you said that we do not want to use uh, t dots in our logic. Absolutely. It is not part of the set of lang formulas. The statements in the logic are sitting inside this set. And inside this, you will not find a double colon, any recursive definition at all. This is all in our description of the language, right. This is what logicians will call the meta language. Right. This is all part of the meta language. Inside the language, you will have only things like for all x, there exists x, etc, etc. I have not put any, I have not even put colons out here if you like, right. I do use parenthesis here, but that is about all. And in fact, Sir, you, that is why yeah. you are able to do this uh, recursion break because it is not a language, our yeah. description. Yeah, I mean, so um, logicians, uh, I mean, this is again, we are taking baby steps, right. Of course, at some point you want to grow up and you do want to use recursion within the language also. And then you want to put the meta language inside the language also. Why not? You can do all that. And these are beautiful things and Solomon Pfefferman has so called reflection principles where uh, you can start talking about the meta language within the language and so on, fun. But we would not do it for now, okay. In computer science there is this logic programming where uh, you know logic programming languages uh, delight and doing all that as part of the thing and uh, make it uh, into your, yeah, okay. So, I must Sir, say. what is this a big phi symbol? Yeah, this is the set of all formulas of the language. Yeah, this set of this set of formulas is defined inductively using this. This is what is being right. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I see lots of people whom whose videos are not on, which is okay. But I want to see them at some point. Right. Uh, I have made it clear in my emails right in the beginning that at some point I have to see who I am talking to. And I have not heard a word or this, so please, that is part of the deal, yeah. I do want some interaction, right, and I want to know who I am talking to, yeah. The, yeah, so the, this is the syntax. Now, once you have the syntax, now we can talk about the meaning, right, because right now, well, already before we even talk about the meaning of all these things, there are certain questions, right, okay. Let us get to the language, our favorite language, okay. So, the language that I am always going to take as default, for instance, is the language of order, the language of arithmetic, right. These are things that, you know, equations with numbers, something that we are used to. So, let us take those examples, right. Now, okay. So, let us say that in the language of order, right, you can write this.
Now, it is useful to have parenthesis here as you can see, right. For all x, for all y, for all z, x less than y and y less than z implies x less than z. This is for transitivity of the order relation. We write formulas of this kind and this is a formula. In the language of order, this formula belongs to the set of all formulas. Is it clear? But supposing I write what about this? For all x, x less than there exists y. It does not look like a formula, right. But how do you argue that this is not a formula? Well, yes, but uh, you are that is what you are claiming. But let us have a proof that it does not belong to the set of formulas. There exists pricing seems Sorry, somebody is saying I have to know who it is. Uh, uh, Ananya. Yes, Ananya. Uh, so, there exists y seems incomplete. Incomplete what? How? Yeah. Um, so, there should be a, yeah, there should be a statement uh, that should follow there exists y. Okay. Yeah. So, how would we argue, right? Suppose this is a formula, right? If this is a formula, for all x with something following that has to be the formula, right? So, then this has to be a formula. x less than there exists y has to be a formula. But for that, less than is a predicate symbol. So, this has to be a term x is a term that is ok, but is this is a term it is not a term this is not a member of t right. Y belongs to t, but there exists y does not belong to t therefore, this is not a formula that is the whole idea of writing all this kind of inductive definitions. You should be able to take a string of things and say whether this is a legal formula it is it in the set of formulas or it is not and you should be. So, the first algorithmic question that we look at we will have lots of algorithmic questions to consider. I will go 0 given a string in the alphabet a string over the alphabet. What is the alphabet for us? Let me call it sigma L. Is it a formula? So, this is an algorithmic question, a very natural algorithmic question. So, what is the alphabet that we have got? The alphabet includes set of constant symbols, set of function symbols, set of predicate symbols, set of variables, all of these and you have parenthesis, commas, equality and these symbols connectors, right. Take any such string and algorithmically you should determine whether it is a legal formula or not. So, very natural question, right. This is the input and you have to say yes or no. Can you tell me how your algorithm will proceed? Sir, uh, there is a Yes, sir, who is it? If we if we pick up sir, it is ordinary. Okay. Sir, if we take a whole string and then break down it into sub formulas, we will eventually get down to an atomic formula. Yes, but as an algorithm, how will you go about it? How will you break things down? I will uh, take an what you are uh, given is a string. Take a string Yes, you are take you are given the string and now you start and tell me yeah. Where will you start? String and then I will from the uh, first first uh, first word of the string. Okay, first symbol yeah. Okay, maybe it's a parenthesis. Let's say. Okay, it's a parenthesis and then what do you do? Then I will sc scan through the entire string until I reach the first what they say the first connective. The principal connective of that form. Let us say it is this. 
Uh, what principle can I? I don't know anything. Uh, it's a string. I am processing the string. Uh. I saw a parenthesis and then you told me that I should keep on moving until I find a connective and I found one. Okay, so for an algorithmic question, a natural thing to ask is what is your representation, right? What is your data structure for representing the formula, right? You, you are given an input, I want to find out it is a formula, right? Can you tell me is there a natural representation of formulas? Can you think of a data structure that represents formulas? What is the most natural data structure? The terms. I am not talking about terms, I am talking about formulas. Of course, I have to look at terms also. When I have an inductive definition like this. Stack. Stack. stack? Why stack? Stack. Why? Who said that? You have to tell me who is Hawking. Uh, okay, so why is a stack a natural? Yeah. Because uh, we can uh, look for the connective first. Like, uh, I just have this intuitive idea because. Uh, yes, because uh, of the parenthesis, the you want to go match the parenthesis perhaps. But yeah, parentheses are there for our convenience. But well, okay. Um, we are almost running out of time. So, let me say the most natural representation for a formula when you see a formula what you should think of is a tree. Right? What is not alpha? Not alpha is a tree. Alpha is inductively a tree. So, you have a node with a not. What about or? Well, alpha and so on for all x. Yeah. So it is a tree whose internal nodes are all labeled by some connective or a quantifier. What will be there in the leaf nodes where you cannot go further? primitive statement, right? Okay. It will be either you will have atomic formulas, equality or something like this. That is it. Now, again, what about uh, how do you check whether something is, so once you know how to check whether something is an atomic formula, it is clear that your algorithm now can check whether a string is a formula. What will it do? It will try to construct the tree. If it succeeds in constructing it as a tree where the internal nodes are all labeled by connectives and quantifiers and the leaf nodes are labeled by uh, atomic formulas, it will say yes, it is a formula. If it cannot, if it gets stuck at any point like it happened with the, what the example that I took, it will say no. <coughs> Is this clear? That is the algorithm. But then now you should be able to check that it is a legal atomic formula. In the language of arithmetic is this a legal uh, 3 uh, 3 x plus 5 y equal to 22. This is my favorite example, right? This is a legal atomic formula, right? Because x is a variable, 3 is a constant. So, this stands for 3 dot x plus 5 dot y. Dot is a function symbol. It wants two parameters, two arguments. So, this is a term, this is a term, therefore, the plus of this is a term. So, this whole thing is a term and this is a constant, it is a term. So, T1 equals T2, it is okay. But again, how do you check that? What is the data structure to represent a term? Look at this here. What is the natural data structure for a term? Again, tree, right? This is a tree where Well, the, these are all trees and then you have one, yeah. A term is a tree whose non-leaf nodes are all labeled by function symbols and the leaf nodes are labeled by constants and variables. So, when you want to check that T1 equals T2, you check, you build a tree for this, build a tree for this, 
and then there is an equality which is a symbol with this, it is okay. Here again check that there are m arguments, each of them are trees, then you check, right. So, an algorithm can do this job, how much time does this algorithm take? Ananya, what do you think? So, this algorithm now we have actually described how the algorithm will go, yeah. So, I am not, by the way these algorithmic questions will keep popping up and we will discuss it in these informal terms. I am not going to write down the algorithms. I hope you will for your own sanity, write down the algorithm, estimate you know its running time, check that what we are talking about all makes sense, yeah. So, what do you think was the running time of this algorithm? So, we first need to scan the entire string. Yes, certainly we need to do that, ok. So, yeah. scanning should take time and uh, uh, constructing should. Well, wait, wait, wait. For doing analysis, first we should be able to talk about the length of the input, right. So, what is the length of a formula? Well, that we will define as what is the length of alpha, yeah. Well, what is the length of negation alpha? It is whatever is the length of alpha plus 1. What is the length of alpha or beta? Length of alpha plus length of beta plus 1, right. So, basically if you think about it, it is exactly the number of nodes in the tree representing alpha right. And I will use this, yeah, these two lines to talk about the length of alpha. That is it, that is a precise definition and we can work with that. And the tree is implicitly defined here, yeah. So, now Ananya, and again similarly the length of a term, the same thing above, the number of nodes in the tree representation of the term, right. And therefore, you can talk about the length of atomic formulas and so basically when you start with formulas you construct the tree and by the time you get to atomic formulas you will have little trees, term trees floating, floating from there and then you can talk about the length of the whole thing. So, there is some honest counting. Somebody is asking me what is honest counting, yeah this is all honest counting, right. And uh, yeah, so now you can see that the algorithm that we are talking about, yeah, in terms of the size of the input, how much time does it take, right. So, in, I give you its input is the formula some string s, right. Now, in terms of the size of the string, it tries to construct a tree and if it succeeds, it is fine, otherwise it stops. So, what will be the running time. Remember you have to visit all the nodes of the tree, right. So, that you need to do and that is all. So, basically you have to visit all the nodes of the tree. So, it is linear in the size of the thing. So, there is a linear time algorithm for as I said do not take it for granted when somebody says the only way to learn is to actually write down the algorithm, make sure write set write the recurrence, check that what you got. This is a very trivial thing, right. But very soon I think by Monday we will have some algorithm questions which are already non-trivial. So, we will have to get into the habit of that. But uh, it is also good to start thinking about for those who care, yeah, right. If you are the kind who likes to write programs, I think this is a very easy program to write, right. You can write a program in Python, you can write a program as I said in Prolog, Lisp, what have you, Haskell, it is very straightforward to take you know take a string and check whether what you have got is a first order formula and uh, you know implement the data structure as a tree and it is great to keep because I, you know as you build many things, maybe you want to reason about in the language of rings, you have got some implementation ready right in the first order theory of rings and you have got uh, you can do equation solving, real arithmetic what have you, okay. So, it is time and I am going to stop, thank you.
today's pretty much what we talked about everything is on this board today and this is it right and but now the next step is to actually start discussing meanings how to construct meanings to these formally and then say whether the statement is true or false and uh, determining truth and falsity etc again with algorithmic questions on checking whether something is true that's the topic of the next lecture okay. thank you any questions anything Okay, write to me. Uh, for, oh. Yeah. Uh, for this last thing, can we like alternatively use prefix formulas to check for the validity of the syntax? Of course. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use prefix, you can use postfix, infix. You know, tree traversal, right? It's that's why I said you once you think of it as a tree, how your algorithm is going to represent the tree. It can traverse the tree using whatever form your favorite uh, tree traversal, and that's fine. Yeah. Anybody else?